We welcome you this morning to our worship service. It's good to be back in God's house with God's people. We invite you this time to join together. Stand and sing with us how great thou art. You are great and perform wonders. Oh Lord my God, when I also wonder, consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. When through the woods and forest blades I wander, I hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down on lofty mountain grandeur, Well, 
will come back again. To worship you in song and spirit of truth. Lord, the words that have already been spoken, the blood that is shed for my soul. It's difficult some days to say it as well with my soul. But God, I thank you that we know that you are a God who sits on his throne. You're sovereign over all. And we can say it is well with my soul. God, I thank you for this church, Lord, and those gathered, not only here, but watching on Facebook or YouTube. God, we are still the church. And God, together we worship you and praise you. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Is good also to just be here to worship together with a group where two or three are gathered together. The Lord is with us. In the book of Revelator, book of Revelation that John saw the visions. In chapter 6, verse 7, the word tells us, When the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard a voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, an ashen horse. And he who sat on it had the name Death. And Hades was followed with him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence or plague and by the wild beast of the earth. As we're going through this pestilence time, this pandemic that is worldwide, we get just a glimpse of what could happen. There are over seven billion souls alive on this planet, almost eight billion, one fourth at a time will be taken through pestilence and wild beast, sword. Tragedy is coming, but take courage. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul. But we don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep so that you will not grieve as, to, as do the rest of, of those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we, who are alive and remain, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. I bring you comfort. God will not leave us, nor will he forsake us. And only the redeemed are going to hear that voice, that cry of the archangel when he says, Come home, children. Only the redeemed. Changed in the twinkling of an eye. Oh. 
up to now we've been looking through a glass so dark and dead oh and only a few mysteries have we known but I sense now in my spirit his return Out, and God's trumpet will be gone. And from the redeemed will hear His voice on that day when He comes in clouds of glory to catch us all. are alive in Jesus, oh, we which are alive in Jesus, yes, we which are alive in Jesus, will be changed in the twinkling of a Those that are alive in Jesus will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Those who have faith in him, Jesus replied to him, just have faith in God. Join me in singing, have faith in God. Have faith in God when your pathway is lonely. He sees and knows all the way you have tried. Never alone are the least of his children. When your prayers are unanswered, your earnest plea he will never forget. Wait on the Lord, trust his word and be patient. Have faith in God, he'll answer yet. Have faith in God, he's on his throne. Have faith in God, he watches over his own. He cannot fail, he must prevail. Have faith in God, have faith in God, have faith in God in your pain and your sorrow. His heart is touched with your grief and despair. Cast all your cares and your burdens upon Him and leave them there, oh leave them there. Have faith in God, though all else fell about you, have faith in God. Provides for his own. He cannot fail, for all kingdoms shall perish. He rules, he reigns upon his throne. Have faith in God, he's on his throne. Have faith in God, he watches over his own. He cannot fail, he must prevail. Have faith in God, have faith in Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. Stand and sing to it. You are the This is 
is what I pray. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. Brother Cliff is going to come. If you have a need this morning, a prayer request, something that uh, you need the church to pray with you about, if you would just uh, lift your hand, want to recognize those. Who, okay, we have several in the congregation that are in special need of prayer. So, Brother Cliff, if you would come. Father, it is such a blessing to be back together today to enjoy the fellowship that we have, not only with you, but with Christian friends, those members of the same congregation. We praise you, God, that we have this opportunity to fellowship, fellowship together today and to worship you together. Lord, we lift up those of our membership who are having difficulties at this time, those who are ill, those who may have procedures planned, those who are not able to get out at this time. Lord, we just lift them to you and ask you, God, that you would encourage them, that you would lift them up in their spirit, or that your Holy Spirit would undergird them and they would realize and recognize your presence and your power in their lives. Father, I lift up our pastor now as he comes to open the word and to share with us what you have blessed him with this week as he studied Lord, help us to have ears to hear and a heart to take in the message presented. Father, we love you. We praise you for who you are. Thank you for this music we've had today and how it has lifted us and how uh, it has been a, an opportunity to lift our voices and praise to you. God, thank you for loving us. It's in Jesus' name we ask all this. Amen. I'm trying to get used to all these things hanging on my ear. Um, my wife said, you know, you're not listening very well. And I said, I haven't been able to wear my hearing aids. Every time I take the mask off, they flip them on the floor and uh, don't want to lose them. They cost too much. I'd like to begin, uh, we're in Isaiah chapter 56, but I'd like to begin by reading to you um, a couple of verses out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul begins and he says, I make known to you, brothers, the gospel which I have preached to you, which also you receive, in which also you're standing, through which also you're being saved. What is the word of the gospel we preach to you? If you hold fast, uh, but even so, that you have not believed in vain. For I received, or I have given to you that first of order, what I have received, that Christ died on behalf of our sins according to the scriptures. And they was buried, and they rose on the third day according to scriptures. It begins there, it says that he died according to scriptures, was buried and raised according to scriptures. Two things about that. First of all, it's plural. So it's not looking at one passage. When we read that, most often we're thinking about the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But that's not the scriptures he's talking about. He's talking about the Old Testament. And reading through the Old Testament, he says the scriptures testify to the death, to the burial, to the resurrection of Christ. And so with that in regard, and again, as we preach through sections of Isaiah, and this morning we're looking at Isaiah 56 verses 1 to 8, 
we have to understand that it's written as a whole, as a book. So that the Messiah was presented as the Emmanuel in chapter 7 through chapter uh, 12, where we find about what his birth is going to be like. We find about what his ministry is going to be like. We find that it's going to be successful because the Holy Spirit um, is going to be resting upon him and that the Holy Spirit is going to empower him. We came into Isaiah in this section, second section uh, that began in chapter 40, and there were four songs, four songs that are called servant songs. In fact, we're introduced specifically to the servant. And each one of these are picturing that the servant is coming as a substitute. He's coming to substitute himself on behalf of Israel. And most clearly, it's given at the last three verses of chapter 52, which ought to actually be in chapter 53, and all of chapter 53. And we saw that. He is coming to suffer and die as a substitute, as a sacrifice on behalf of our sins, our transgressions, our iniquity. All of those things are mentioned, that he would bear them and carry them, and that God was going to make it successful. And that he would be lifted up and that he'd be raised and greatly exalted. That's how it began. So before the crucifixion ever was declared, God already declared the victory of it all. That God wasn't waiting and hoping that it was going to come about, that Jesus would come walking out of the grave. He declared it beforehand that he was going to rise up, that he's going to be lifted up, and that he's going to be greatly exalted. And so in chapter 55, we saw an invitation. He says, come, come. If you're thirsty, you're hungry, come. Buy without money, without cost. Why do you spend your money on that which, which is not, uh, that you cannot buy? Come freely. Come eat and drink. And so the invitation to come in chapter 55. Well, we come, and we come to Christ by faith. But coming to Christ by faith, there is a call to obedience. And obedience follows faith. Just as in Matthew chapter 28 when he says, Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them. Not just baptizing them, bringing them to faith so that they follow Christ in obedience and baptism, but teaching them. Teaching them what? To keep, to guard, whatsoever I have commanded. Was he just talking about the gospel stories? No, because we find that the Hebrew, right, Paul writing to the Hebrews says that Jesus Christ is the one that gave the law. So it's everything. It's not been cast aside. It is teaching us obedience, and it teaches us to, to turn away and repel sin. So with that in mind, let me read. Thus saith Yahweh, keep justice, do righteousness, for my salvation is near and coming. My righteousness is being revealed. Blessed is the man who does this, the son of man who is established in it. He who is keeping the Sabbath undefiled, and who is keeping his hand from doing evil. Concerning the foreigner who has joined himself to Yahweh, do not say, Yahweh will certainly separate me from his people. Concerning the eunuch, do not say, Behold, I'm a dry tree. For thus saith Yahweh, To the eunuch who keeps my Sabbath, who chooses that in which I delight, and who holds fast to my covenant, I will put for them in my house, within my walls, hand and name, or a memorial, better than sons and daughters, and I will give him an eternal name, which cannot be cut off. To the son of the foreigner, who joins himself to Yahweh, to serve and to love the name of Yahweh, and to be his servants, and all who keep the Sabbath undefiled, and who hold fast to my covenant, I will bring them into my holy mountain, and I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. The whole burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable upon my offer, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Declares Adonai Yahweh, who gathers the exiles of Israel, and again I shall gather unto him, besides all of those who have already been gathered unto him. We look at this, and there's a call to an obedience. And the call to obedience is to two things, to justice and to righteousness. Well, we ask ourselves, well, what is specifically is he talking about justice? Are we talking about what's going on today with social justice? Well, in part, but not in whole. Justice has to do... The term, the Hebrew term is mishpat. It means to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. That we act, we act rightly because it is right for us to act rightly. If I, if I see that my, my neighbor has left his, uh, his car running, and it's happened, we've had members, older members that have now gone to be with the Lord. Uh, I think of one, Miss Han Wu. 
and she pulled up to the church and she left her key in the car and the car was running, the door was open. And so what do you do when you get there and you see her car's outside and the door's open and the key's in it and it's running? Do you go, huh, she must be just running in and running out. Well, not Miss Ann Wu. And so if we would have left it there, then what would have happened to her car? When she came out, it would have been gone because of all the traffic that was going back across our parking lot going to Walmart. And so the reality is, what do you do? You do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. You go and you turn her car off. You take the key out. You lock the door, shut the door. You bring her keys into her. She goes, oh, I didn't realize I left the car running. You do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And it seems like that we have, we have a dwarf, we have an absence of those kinds of ability to make that kind of decision. If someone has left something out in their yard, and they maybe have forgotten that they've left it out there and then gone into the house for the evening. Do you leave it out there for somebody to take? No, you knock on the door and say, did you know you left your lawnmower out in the front? Did you know that you left your whatever it is out in the front yard? In fact, it's what Philippians chapter 2 says. He says, have this mind which, is in, which Christ Jesus was in Christ Jesus himself. Have this mind in you as well. But in the verses previous to that, it says, and that you don't look out for your own things, but you look out for the things of others. And for me, it always reminded me uh, that there was a sign going to Dallas up north of uh, Fairfield. And it had a picture of this old broken down fence and cows jumping out. And the sign said, are your cows out lately? Well, that's, you know, if your cows get out, now you don't have cows in here, I'm sure. Looking around at the group that we have here today, we don't have any uh, cattlemen. But if the cows do get out, I remember on occasion, Francis and I were driving from Dallas down to her mom and dad's in Madisonville. And right about where that sign was, there must have been 20 young calves that were out. They were probably about 800 pounds. And they were out running alongside of Highway 45. So do we drive on and just keep going and uh, just leave them out there to maybe get out into the highway and get to hurt them or kill themselves and then to injure others? What do you do? How do you round up 20 cows? Well, you do what your grandfather did. Francis is out there going, Sue, 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 Sue. She's going to hang me with this. <laughs> she's out there, she's calling the cows. And we get all those cows rounded up, we get them going down this little gravel uh, road, and the farmer comes out with a trailer, and it, he was just beside himself. But uh, we run the cows, these little calves, we run them down the, uh, down the road so that the cows didn't get into the. Now, that occupied about an hour and a half of our time. So that was our time that we could have been on down the road from Addisonville, and we could have been enjoying the time with her mom and dad, maybe eating supper or whatever, that you look out that justice means that you do that which is right all the time. You don't take what's, what someone has dropped, you don't take what doesn't belong to you, and to do righteousness. And again, when we think about doing righteousness, uh, again, they're parallel, and it gives us uh, the illustration of what those are, specifically in verse two. He says, it's keeping the Sabbath undefiled. What's that mean? That we put, when we come to worship the Lord, we don't come in with all the trash and all the filth that we've done all week long, unrepentant, unconfessed, that when we come to worship the Lord, that those things that we have defiled ourselves with, that we've confessed, we've repented, and that we've asked God to cleanse us, like 1 John 1, 9. That it's not, again, not speaking to the lost, but to the Christian, that if we confess our sins, he's writing it to a church, he's not writing it to the world. If we confess our sins, that God's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we're going to do righteousness, and we are sinners, then we must confess our sins before God. For as Paul said in the book of Acts, that we're to repent towards God and have faith towards Christ. A repentance of the things that we do. And he gives us a reason. He gives us a call of why we need to do this. And what's the reason? He says, my salvation is near to coming my righteousness to being unveiled. And again, the picture is, is taking the coat off and bearing his arm. That God's righteousness is coming. It's about to be revealed. The salvation's coming. Well, what's he talking about? Well, he's talking about what he said in chapter 53, or 52, um, verses 13 down through 53, um, and verse 12, the end of it. His salvation, his righteousness is coming. It's getting ready to be unveiled. It's the coming of Jesus Christ. For them at the time, he says, Christ is coming. My salvation is coming. My righteousness. If you want to know what righteousness is, then look at Christ. At the, during the Sermon on the Mount, 
he appealed to those that were sitting on the side of the mountain and he said, except your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. You're not going to come unless it exceeds theirs. And they seem to think of themselves that they were at the top of, the, of their game, that they were better than everyone else. And he says, if your righteousness isn't better than that, you're not coming in the kingdom of heaven. Well, I can look around, and I don't know everything that you do. I don't know all of your secrets. I don't know all your hidden things God does. But I know this, that my righteousness does not exceed that of anybody else's. I am no more righteous than the next man, or the next woman, or the next child. So how is my righteousness going to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees? And there's only one righteousness that God will accept, and that's the righteousness of Christ. That Jesus Christ came to live righteously before God his Father on our behalf. Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 5, he said, we're not only saved by his death, but we're saved by his life. The life that he lived imputes, gives to our, to our accounting, it adds to our credit his life and his work and his righteousness. So that when God looks at me, I think we sing a, a song like that. Uh, when he looks at me, he sees his righteousness. He sees the blood he shed. I'm glad that when he looks at me, that that's who he sees, not me, but him. That he sees Christ because we're clothed, we're dressed in Christ. My salvation's near, my righteousness is coming, and my righteousness is near to being revealed. Question. Harold just sang it in a, in a song a moment ago about the return of Christ. Are we living in such a way that we will not be the naughty children when Christ does come? I know I've used the illustration before, but I did the 12-year-old boys G or RA basketball when I, of course, was saved over in spring. And I'd taken them at the end of the season over to Astral World, so you can tell how long ago that was. And I'd taken them to Astral World, and I gave the boys all instructions that we were going to be at the gate at 10 o'clock ready to load on the church bus. So the boys didn't get that message too particularly. And they had figured out that people lose change in the uh, roller coasters and the things that sling them. And so they were climbing on top of buildings. They were going underneath the, the places that were probably pretty dangerous, gathering up change. They both come out with pockets full of change. And, uh, but they didn't come out until 11 o'clock. But the security brought them out because they were still looking for change. They were making a killing. And so the bus had already left. Their salvation was nearing the coming and righteousness being revealed. But they didn't make the bus. And the bus had gone, and here we are sitting in, I'm responsible for these boys, so I'm sitting there on the bench waiting for their moms and dads to drive from Spring up north of Houston all the way down to Astral World, and then flipping coins to see who had to take me. Because they wanted, both wanted to address their boys uh, for their behavior, and they didn't want to wait until they got home. God's salvation is near into being, into coming, and his righteousness to being revealed. It was revealed in Christ, but there's a day coming. There's a day of accounting that's coming, and we don't want to be found waiting outside. We want to be doing that which the Lord has called us to do. And so he gives us a proverbial statement of wisdom. What is it that God delights in? What is it that pleases God? And he says he delights in the Sabbath. Blessed is the man who does this, and the man and the son of man who is established in this. It means that this is his foundation. This is the one that does this, and this is the one that's founded upon it. What is it? He keeps my Sabbath and his fire. You know, I, I was preaching through Ezekiel a few years back, and I come to chapter 22, and there's a paragraph in there that's 23 to 31, and it talks about how everything had become undefiled. And right in the middle of it, he talks about that they have disgraced, they have disgraced my Sabbath so that I am profaned among them. And he, who is he talking about? He's talking about the priest in verse 25 that conspired um, in their midst, and they, they were tearing them. In verse 26, the priest have also defiled, uh, done violence, and they profane my holy things. And they have made no distinction between what's holy and common, and neither have they taught them the distinction between unclean and clean. They've disregarded my Sabbath so that I am profaned among them. From the, from the priests and prophets, they go to the princes. And they're tearing and dishonest gain, and the prophets are smearing whitewash over them. They're saying, oh, they're, what they're doing, it's okay. They're giving false visions. They're saying that God says it's all right for them to do what they're doing. 
They oppress the poor and the needy, and they've extorted from them the sojourner without justice. And I sought from among them a man who was who among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found none. God holds the Sabbath in high honor. Well, Sabbath was yesterday. And we as Gentiles worship on the Lord's day, the day that Christ rose from the grave. And Paul told the, uh, told the Romans, he says, that to each man he sets that day apart. So that for one man it's one day, for another it's another. So if there are those that choose to worship on, on Saturday, and not so much here in the States, but when you leave the country you find a lot do. That we take the day that we sit aside to worship the Lord and we treat it as holy. What's one of the fears I have of this pandemic that we've had? People have gotten out of the habit of coming together and setting a time aside a time to worship the Lord. It's been at my convenience and at my opportunity. Now churches were already doing that, offering them you know all kinds of alternatives. You don't want to get up on Sunday morning, fine. Go on Friday night. That way you can do you know you can go to the lake, you can go to the beach, you can do whatever on Sunday, or let's do it Saturday night. Or let's do it, you know, they would give alternative times because it wasn't really about setting aside a time specified that you find whether in the Old Testament or you find in the New Testament set aside for a time of worship to come together as God's people to worship. And he uses participles, so he's talking about its characteristic. In fact, we find that there are five times he uses the term shamar, which means to to keep or to, uh, to do in the sense of to guard it. And we find that out of those five times, three of them are participles. So it's looking individually at this is what we're doing. That here's the person that's blessed is the one who is, it's his lifestyle is to guard the Sabbath. That he takes that day that he worships the Lord and he guards it. He puts up parameters and says, I'll not do this on a Sabbath. Now I can't set the parameters for you. Nor do I have a desire to, to tell you what you can and can't do on, on a Sunday. But my dad did that for me. And there are things that were so instilled that they're still there today. I never went hunting or fishing on a, on a Sunday. Sunday afternoon, we might go play yard football or basketball. But we didn't do anything during the time that we were supposed to be in church. It was always guarded as first place. There were activities that we did not do during the time that was set aside for worship. Now, mom's side of the family was more strict than that because, again, her, they were all Baptists. My family in Indiana weren't. They were, they were old, wicked, <laughs> Gentile, you know, uh, loose living, dancing, the whole thing up there. They weren't Methodists, no. So that'll kind of calm you down. But they were, uh, they were Plymouth Brethren. And which is kind of a, a different brand of a Baptist. And so we did all of those things. They kind of had looser guidelines. But when I got to Arkansas with our Baptist family down there, you didn't even go swimming at the, in the, swim, at the creek, mixed company. You didn't mix bathing, which never made sense to me because if the girls are out, out on the bank and the guys are in the water, you know, what's going on here? Or you flip the back and forth. If you're swimming at the same place at the same time, it, it never made sense to me, but they had more rules than we did. And but we followed the rules because we were doing it. And on Sunday afternoons after lunch, everybody laid down took an hour nap. Everybody. And Grandma only had a two-bedroom house, a four-room house, living room and two bedrooms, uh, corner to corner, and then the kitchen. And so you slept on the porch, you slept on the ground, you slept in the truck, you slept in the everywhere. Wherever you could find a place to, to throw down a mat, um, or sit in a chair, everybody took a nap because that was the rules. You kept it because it was a day of rest. And it was a day that you didn't do the other things that you did. Well, again, I'm not telling you what to do on the Sabbath. But I am telling you this, that it needs to be set apart. It ought to be different than Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday. It ought to be a time that Sunday is set as distinct from any other day. And he keeps his hand from doing any kind of evil. That he doesn't do anything evil. That he's not just on, set on the Sabbath or on Sunday. But he, he doesn't do evil. He won't let himself be drawn into it. And these are in the proverbial sense. This is what God likes in. And this is the person whom God blesses. This is the one that is established in these things. Of righteousness and justice. That God blesses. 
But there are two categories of people who are excluded. They're excluded in the law. They're excluded in the, in the commonwealth. And one of them is the children of, of strangers, foreigners. They can come into the covenant community, but they're not allowed inside the fence. They're kept out. There's a wall of barrier that Paul says have been broke down, that the two have been made one. Where that wall of barrier, that separation, all you've got to do is go to Ephesians chapter 2, begin in verse 11. And it talks about everything that Gentiles, which will be the sons of the foreigners, daughters of the foreigners, everything that they don't have. They don't have the, they don't have the promises. They don't have the commonwealth. They don't have, they don't have circumcision. They don't have the sign. They don't have anything. They don't have Christ. They don't have God. And they're without hope in the world, which is a pretty good category of, of things that we're missing apart from Christ. But he says, but now they have been brought near. Near to what? Everything that they are far off from. Because that wall of barrier of enmity has been torn down. It's, it's separated. So that there's one people. Not two, but there is one people. Because God has brought them. And so when we look at these two categories, and we see the responses, and he, and he says it again in verse, um, in verse 3, now concerning, now concerning, speaking first of the foreigners and second of the eunuchs. And the eunuch says, look at me, what have I got to offer? I'm nothing but a dry tree. The, the foreigner, he says, even though I've joined myself to Yahweh, even though I have committed myself to worship the Lord, ultimately I'm going to be excluded from both the Lord and from his people. I'm never going to really be a part. I'm always going to be separated. Now think about this. I look around this room, and that's every one of you. Every single one of you. The sons of the form. Excluded. You're not Jews. You weren't born Jews. You didn't have Jewish heritage. You don't have Jewish roots. You're a Gentile. So when he says this, you make it personal. Put your name in. He says, I'm excluded. Oh, I've joined myself to the Lord, but under the law, I'm excluded. What is there for me? I won't be part of the people of God. I won't be included. And there's some that would keep you there. There are some that would keep you excluded from the promises of God. But Paul says to the Galatians that we, we who are by faith of Abraham are the children of Abraham. Because the seed of the promises was Jesus Christ. Not to the nation, but to one. To one seed. To Jesus Christ. And if we're in Christ, then the promises are ours as well. We're not looking for a separate, a separate kind of promises that are going to come. We're one with them. We've been brought into them. And there isn't the separation. And so it, what, what, what would have excluded us, he says, it hasn't. Why? Because God makes a declaration. God's the one that speaks. And he says first to the eunuch. To the eunuch who has kept my Sabbath. There it comes again. We find three times he addresses it in relationship to the Sabbath. And he says, so, and both the eunuch and to the, uh, um, and to the foreigner, and then to all who are blessed. The Sabbath seems to be important to God, doesn't it? So to the eunuch who keeps my Sabbath, who chooses that which I delight in, and holds fast to my covenants. Now, the only time, the first time that he uses covenants in here, but he'll repeat it again to the son of the foreigner. What covenant is he talking about? Well, just flip your page back to chapter 54. And in chapter 54, verse 10, and he says, My covenant or my covenant of faithfulness, which is with you, will not depart, and my covenant of peace will not be removed, says uh, Yahweh, who has compassion upon you. My covenant of peace. Well, where in the world is this covenant of peace established? We go back to the servant song. We go back to Isaiah 52, verses 13, all the way through 53. Because Christ has established it, because Christ has redeemed us, because Christ has bought us, we have peace with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. So there's a covenant of peace, and God's covenant of faithfulness, it will not depart, it will not be removed from us. He comes down to verse 3 of chapter 55. And he says, So incline your ear and come unto me, and hear that your soul may live. And I will establish with you an everlasting covenant. The covenant faithfulness of David has been confirmed. An everlasting covenant. And again, the promises God made to David of a son sitting upon his throne forever. To always have a son sitting upon the throne. And so again, it points back to Jesus Christ. An everlasting covenant. So when we come to the Lord's table, what are we coming to? We're coming to the covenant of promises. The covenant of peace. This everlasting covenant that was established in the person of Jesus Christ. And he says, and they keep my covenant. 
that they hold fast to it. What's their hope in? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ's solid rock I stand. All other ground sinking sand. All other ground sinking sand. This is my hope. This is my trust. This is where I stand. And they're holding fast to this covenant. And they, and they choose to do that which delights and pleases God. What's God going to give to the eunuch? And I think of four particularly in my mind. Actually, it could add a fifth one. I think of a young boy named Daniel. That was taken from his father's house and made a eunuch in the house of the king of Babylon. I think about his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were made eunuchs so that their desire was only to do their job, no other interest. Their lives seemed to be ruined, and yet God blessed them in the midst of their faithfulness. And he said, they'll not be cut off, and they'll not be forgotten. They'll not be left out because they have been cut, and because they are now eunuchs. I think about an Ethiopian that made his way to Jerusalem to worship the Lord, and he left with the scroll of Isaiah. He's reading from Isaiah 53, and Philip runs up beside him and says, you know what you're reading? He goes, no, how can I know unless someone explains to me? He climbs up in the chariot and explains Christ to him from Isaiah chapter 53, what we've just spoken of. And the man believes upon the Lord and he says, what prevents me from being baptized? There's water. There was nothing to prevent him. Why? Because what does God require? One thing. Faith upon the Lord Jesus Christ as we repent from our sins and draw near unto him. So God says to him, I will give to them in my house, in my walls, in my house, right where I am. I'm going to put in my house, inside my walls, I'm going to give inside of there. And the term, the Hebrew says a hand and a name. The hand and the name. Better than sons and daughters. And he's speaking about a monument, something that's in there. I'd like to read to you a couple passages really shortly. But a couple of passages from the book of Revelation and to the letters to the seven churches. And the first of them um, is to the church of Pergamon. And the church of Pergamon, when we come to the end of it, where he says, And to him who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the, over, to the one who overcomes, I will give to him the hidden manna, and I will give to him a, a white stone, and upon that, a new name which has already been written, which no one knows except the one who is receiving it. I'm going to give him a white stone with a name written upon it. I'm going to give him something in the presence of God. Flip over just a page or two to the church of Philadelphia. And to the church of Philadelphia, we read this, beginning in verse 12. To the one who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the house, in the temple of God. And he will never be cast out. And upon it, I will write upon it the name of my God and the name of, of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from God, from my God, and the name of, uh, and my new name, the one who has an ear, let him hear what the church says. So he's going to make him a stone. He's going to make him a pillar. And in that on that stone and in that pillar, he's going to have a name that's going to be in the presence of God that will never be cast off and never be cut off and never be sent away. And it's going to be better than sons and daughters. Well, how? It's an everlasting name that I'm going to give to him. And it will not be cut off. A new name. A new name written. I think there's a song that says, I have a new name written down in glory. Yeah. Uh, you know, we sing songs about that. Why? Because they bring joy to us. They delight us. To know that we have been given a name, an eternal name. A name written upon the thigh of Christ that's written in the hand of God that will never be wiped out, that we will always be in the God's presence and always welcome into the God's presence. And here are eunuchs who, would, who could not serve as priests, who could not come to the temple, who could not offer sacrifices, who couldn't do anything. And yet God says that they are coming in the house and they're coming inside the wall and they're not going to have to leave. They will be there in and name. They will be there in my presence forever. We who think to ourselves that there's just nothing that I can do, that I'm so bad, that, that there's everything that I've done in my past, and there may not be speaking to you here today, but I promise you there are people that feel so low, so low, 
They don't have to open the door. They can walk underneath it. Because they feel so bad about themselves and so low and so rejected. And I'm telling you that God can take and make a change. That what we think is discarded, what we think is useless, what we think is, is cast out isn't. Until God finally casts them out on the day when he does come. And it's time that pit men cannot make any changes at all. When it will be established and set in stone. He turns to the son of the foreigner who's taught you, joined himself unto the Lord. And he has chosen to serve God and to love God in the name of God. You know, again, I, I read to you from Ezekiel 22. It says, speaking of the priests, they disregarded my Sabbath so that I am profaned among them. We saw earlier in one of the messages um, in Isaiah, it says that my name is known because it's profaned among the nations. My people know in exile, they know my name. Why? Because my name's blasphemed everywhere. People are using my name, so they know my name. And yet here we find the sons of the foreigners joining themselves unto Yahweh, serving him and loving his holy name. And he says, and they shall be my servants. Why? For all who are keeping my Sabbath undefiled and holding fast to my covenant. Two aspects of it. One, how we treat God and the things that God delights, and the other one is holding fast to the promises of God. And they're both together. It's not like we get to pick and choose that we separate them. It's not, well, I like this part, I don't like that part. Do you notice in both of them that it's both that they keep my Sabbath? How important is the Lord's day? I can't tell you how many conversations in the last three months I've had that people say, well, no, I don't go to church. You know, I've got my own thing with God. You know, and I can't. You sit there and you go, wait a second. You don't get to make it up. If God's offering a relationship to himself, you're going to have to do it under his, under his terms. You don't get to make up your own and say, well, this is how I'll have you, God. Because God won't have you that way. You can't tell God, this is how I'll have you. I'll have a little bit of you. And I'll have you on this, but I don't want you the rest of it. I don't like this stuff. You do it God's way or you don't have it at all. Even Jesus said it, John 14, 6, and everybody here knows that. For I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one, no one, no one comes to the Father except through me. So you can't have it your own way. You only can come God's way. And they hold fast to his Sabbath and they hold fast to his covenants. They hold fast to the promises that God's given them. And that's where their hope lies. And it says, and so he will come into my holy hill. You know, again, I think you think about that. Where is there the question that's raised? Who can ascend into God's holy mountain? Do you remember that from Psalm 24? And he asked that question. He says, again, who can ascend into the mountain of the Lord? And who can rise into his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Is not lifted up his soul to an idol. And is not sworn deceitfully. He takes up the, the blessing from Yahweh. And righteousness from the God um, his salvation who can come David says he who has clean hands and a pure heart he's not defiled the Sabbath he's the one that can come into God's holy presence it's Psalm 24 and he answers it clearly and so he says that he is coming into his holy mountain and he is rejoicing why because it's a house my house it's a house of my prayer so we come before God, and what do we do? We come for prayer. Prayer ought to be characteristic of the church, not something that's done on the side. Two years ago, the state convention sent out people going around to the different associations, and they were trying to encourage churches to pray. And I thought, what a odd thing to do. Why have we gotten so bad off that we have put everything else and we have taken, like the term says, we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater? You know, how have we gotten so bad off that we'd have to have someone come tell us that we need to incorporate prayer during the worship service? You know, I, I think about how we begin. We begin with prayer. In the course of it, we have prayer. At the, at the time of deacons, we have prayer. We have prayer when we close out together. We pray for one another. We pray, for, we pray towards the Lord. Prayer is, a, he said, because my house is a house of prayer. And in that, that they have, been, they have come and that they've loved God and they've entered into God's presence because they have hold fast to his covenants and they do not defile his Sabbath. He says their whole burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable for my altar. They weren't before. 
They could bring them, but they were not acceptable. They would not be received because they were not, they did not have access into the altar. But he says they can come and they can bring their sacrifices. They can bring their whole burnt offerings and I will accept them upon my altar. Now think about that for just a moment. Let that sink in. That you can come to God's presence and that you can rejoice in God's presence. But what are we also to bring? We sing a song. I, uh, we bring the a praise unto the house of the Lord. And so many times we come with nothing at all. We come empty handed. And I'm not, I don't preach, I probably preach less on tithing than any other pastor you'll ever meet. But it doesn't mean I don't believe in it. And it doesn't mean that it's not, it's not because it's not important. I just think it's a natural outflow of being a Christian. I think it's a natural outflow that we give back to him because he's given so freely to us. That, that how can we not give to God? How can we not want to come before God and to give him our offerings and our praise? To give them together, collectively, as a whole. And he says, and again, if you recall, in Matthew, when Jesus entered into the temple to cleanse the temple, and when he's cleansing and driving out the money changers, what did he say to them? And he said to them, it has been written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Well, we find here. And he says the same thing. that gives the reason why they would be acceptable, because my house is a house, shall be called a house of prayer. For who? What's the last phrase say? For who? All people. For men and women. For children. For eunuchs. For foreigners. For all people. Why? Because Christ died for all people. For people from every tribe and tongue and nation, every kind of ethnic group that you can subdivide and subclassify people by, Christ has died for people out of that group. And we read that in, in Revelation chapter 5 when they sing the songs of the redeemed. And so he tells us, declare normally, verse 8, it's written out of order, because normally after he makes a statement, he'd say, declares the Lord Yahweh. But he puts it at the first to make it emphatic. Declares Adonai Yahweh, who has gathered the Israel, uh, the exiles of Israel, and again I shall gather unto them. I shall those to be gathered. God wants us with emphasis to know that He's the one that's gathering people unto Himself. And as I was thinking, reading this, and thinking about it, it reminded me from John, in John chapter ten, the Good Shepherd, when He says, "I," in verse fourteen. I am the good shepherd, and I know those which are mine, and they know me. And just as I have, the Father has known me, and even so I have known the Father, I, I place, the tithomai means to set down, I set down my soul on behalf of the sheep. But other sheep I have which are not of this fold, and even these we must bring, and they hear my voice, and they shall be one fold, one flock. Others that I have. And that's how he ends this. He says, I've gathered, and I've gathered some, but I haven't gathered all. I'm still gathering. I will gather again, and I will gather still, besides those who have already been gathered. So until the day that the Lord comes, God is gathering sheep. He's calling people unto himself to trust and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we consider that, that God is still calling, we saw that last week in chapter 55, that God's still calling, we find the emphasis where he says, come, come, come. Again, five times, come, 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 come. God wants us to come unto him. God wants us to lean upon him, not upon our own understanding, but to lean upon the Lord and trust the Lord. With all that we are, to commit ourselves unto the Lord who will freely save people from all classes, from all groups, without qualification, the eunuch, the son of the foreigner, those that are excluded from most people's gatherings, they will be gathered by the Lord. This morning we're going to have our hymn of, hymn of invitation. And if God's spoken to you here, or if God's spoken to you if you're listening on Facebook or later on YouTube, trust in the Lord. Come to the Lord. Keep His, keep his holy day holy. Undefiled. Do that which pleases God. 
And that which pleases God is believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ, holding fast to his covenant, holding fast to this God. There's a song, I wish I knew how to play it and to sing it. The song you hear it regularly, it says, he will hold me fast, he will hold me fast. It's a beautiful song because when we come to the Lord, guess what? He will hold us fast and he'll lose none. Let's stand.